What's up guys, I'm the Dungeon Coach, and I'm going to help lower that DC in your game by doing a full homebrew breakdown of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Volume 2 is group patrons, we're going to talk about what they are and how they work. I went through all the examples in the book and broke them down into little categories that you can then take, twist, and homebrew to create your own group patron. All throughout the video, I'm going to throw out ideas to you guys, to see if you can spark some creativity for your game, and I'm going to end the whole video with some drama that's going down in the D&D community about somebody that thinks that Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is the worst book. What? So it's go time. Group patrons are super simple. It's basically a group that your party works for and gets certain perks and goes on quests for. Now, a lot of the heat that Tasha's Cauldron's got is that the group patron system isn't flushed out enough, but I think it's fine enough for me to be able to take, see what I'd want to use in my game and run with it. They give eight examples, which I think is plenty enough for me to be able to go through and break down for you guys to get all the parts and get all the pieces that you'd need to be able to tweak and twist for your game. And another thing I did not know about group patrons is there's actually a mechanic to them that actually is in game besides just a quest hub for you to be able to go to and be able to work for. There's an in-game mechanic called group assistance. What it is is your party members or other people that are part of the organization, NPCs that are along with them, can grant advantage to anyone else within the group. It's literally like a free help action on demand. The only requirements are that you can see or hear them. Don't need to do both, just see or hear. Simple shout, simple thumbs up. I don't know what, whatever it is you want it to be. And you cannot be incapacitated. And this is the first piece that I want to take homebrew and run with is having an actual tangible mechanic helps them also feel like they're in a group. So what all do you need to be able to have a fully functioning patron that your group can follow? So let's break these group patrons down into what categories that you need to be able to have to be able to create your own group. And there's eight examples to be able to pull from. I've gone through and broken them all down. So here's another one of those fancy tables. Those five categories are pretty much what you can break down of what consists of a group patron. And you can see them right here. Types are the different types of whatever this group patron is. And for this, I'm going to be scrolling through the academy, which is one of the eight examples, is what type of academy are you in? And the book needs to do these types of academies because there's a lot of different types. But we'll talk about what you actually need. This is just the basics. And then I actually of these five categories, there's three of them that you don't even need. You only need two of them. I'll show you what I'm talking about. So type is what type of group patron are they involved with and then we have perks the second category perks is what why why would you even want to do this what are the benefits of being a part of this group and then there's a contact of some kind of who you are who you're talking to usually this is like the face of the group for you and uh, certain npcs there can be multiple different ones where you go and talk to for certain things and this is like your quest giver if you want to think of it like that um then there's roles the roles are like the the there's these are called factotums <laughs> i had to look up what that word meant um but but student, groundskeeper, all the way up to expert speaker, whatever. These are the different, uh, and I don't know why they put backgrounds associated with these. I mean, I, I, it doesn't really help me at all, but I guess I don't use really backgrounds like that anyway. So uh, different roles in the group of, of your hierarchy of, of how you can work your way up through the thing. And then you have the actual assignments or quests that you actually go out on and do missions for. And as you can see, for every single one of these, for the ancient being, they have a types of different ancient beings. They have perks of what you can gain for being a part of the ancient being a contact of who not the ancient being themselves who's the representative that you talk to as the contact different roles that you're able to work your way through pupil guardian offspring devotee and then the quest that you go on so now let's break this thing down with tasha herself who could all be a very good group patron of the ancient being because she's a witch that wants to collect all these different magic items. What if your group worked for literal Tasha herself and had to go collect magic items for? Do they keep them for themselves? Do they give them back to her? I don't know. So here's my table, but there's more to it than this. This is actually what you need. Now, real quick, let me say this. If you want to run any of the group patrons that are already in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, one of the eight examples they give, you can run those and there they are. They're fine. They're 100% there for you. But I'm talking about if you want to take these and run with them and create your own, what do you need to be able to homebrew these things? I don't think you need type because you're already choosing the thing in the first place. I'm going to give you some examples here in a second of different types of group patrons that I've came up with, but you don't need to come up with a D6 list of different types. Once you've created it and this thing that you want to do, that's just it. You don't need to come up with six different iterations of it because you only need one because that's the one you're going to use. Uh, perks we're going to get into in a second because that's the biggest thing. Uh, contact, like there's some sort of NPC contact just like you would in any quest or anything you ever run, you need to be able to, as the DM, create an NPC for them to talk to. You would just create one and there'd be one. And if you need to create one that's higher up the notch, you'd create that one. You don't need to make a full blown table for this contact. So you need a contact, but you don't need to fully have a D6 table for it. Uh, roles, you do need to have hierarchy of roles. There needs to be some sort of naming system that they have to be able to work through so that they know 
who's higher ranked than them, what rank are they, how do they get to the next one. And I'd also add on top of this, you need to be able to have a systematic way that you can work up through the ranks. The last thing is assignments. You don't need to flush out a D6 table of assignments because those are just, again, the things you would normally run when you're running the game. What are they going to go do? What quests do you want to put in front of them? That's the type of stuff. But what you can do is use these assignments in the book. There's eight different group patrons with six different tables. I don't even know what the math would be on that, but that's a lot of examples of different assignments or quests that you can have inspiration from for your players to go do. Okay, so now I'm going to give you guys some thoughts and examples of just things that came into my head about having to do with group patrons or how I might implement them into my campaign that's already running or hasn't started yet. And then we're going to go over those different perks of the that's the homebrew part of what you really need. What pieces do you need of those two things, the perks and the what was the other thing? Roles, that's right. But that's a super simple one. We're going to really dive into the perks of what kind of different perks you could outfit for your own custom group patron. And at the very end, we'll talk about your group actually becoming the patron themselves. Time out. I'm sorry, but I just could not do a video over group patrons if it didn't talk about my group of patrons. And I see what I did there because like Patreon patrons from pa and then the book is patrons. So far in just the month of November, we've had over 40 patrons join and I cannot thank you guys enough. As soon as I stepped up my game and started releasing monthly homebrew PDFs, I just released the first one in the month of November, you guys stepped it up and supported it even more. So now I'm dialing things up again for the next month's Patreon PDF. It's going to be even bigger. Last time I did a huge homebrew PDF, I put up on the DMs Guild, but this time I want to give it to my patrons. I'm putting the whole thing on the tier one entry reward tier so the most amount of patrons have access to it and I'll be adding on more to the higher levels. And a big shout out to my new ancient dragon, Kevin V, and new platinum dragon, Nate N. Because like I showed you guys in the behind the scenes video, this wouldn't be possible and now all the support can start to help my family. I just want to make sure I show my people over on Patreon some appreciation. Appreciate page. So just, 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 just go, just go. Okay, so my ideas on this. I already threw out the idea of Tasha herself being the group patron, but that's kind of more so the ancient being category. What if your group's patron was the BBEG? And whether you want this to be more overt or not and have this be some seemingly good organization that they're working for that turns out as they find out more and more and they see the clues sprinkled across a very long time that this is actually bad that that's the they've been working for the bbg the whole time or if it's like a subversion type of espionage spy thing where they know that this is the group and they are purposely as spies working for this thing they gotta take it down from the inside and speaking of evil group patrons what if your players were forced into being a part of a group patron and they are literal prisoners within this group and they are forced to go do things and they have to try and figure out how to do those things and make it look like they did those things or try and get out of it or make it if they have an assassination contract make it look like they killed the person but then they really didn't that'd be an entirely very cool twist to a campaign of how they get out of that. And I'll stop right there on that note of you can do this group patron thing in the dead middle of a campaign and just have this group option or you can have multiple and let them choose in the middle. How cool is that? There's a bunch of different organizations. Which one do you want to be a part of? And they can do that and they enter some big city and there's a, few, a bunch of different factions that they have to choose of who to be a part of. Or there's just one and they have an option to join or not. Or on the other end of the spectrum, this is something you could start off a campaign with and have the entire thing revolve around this group that they're a part of. Now, sure, if they want to leave mid campaign, they can. But I think this would be a great conversation and a great thing to bring up about, hey, guy, do you think this would be something cool that you'd want to do? You could send them a link to this video and see if they like group patrons and the whole idea of it. But anyway, you could also have them start their own patron group at the very beginning and they could start off being the group and almost be little entrepreneurs themselves trying to start something. Or like I said, it could kick in later on into the campaign. So my last idea here, and I thought this was really cool and creepy, is a circus. A group patron circus. What would that have in it? We'll talk about that now here when we get into these perks. So let's run with this. Let's say I wanted to build a circus and have a, a group patron circus. We're in a session zero. They say they want to join a circus and have that be the entire thing. What would you need to do as a DM to be able to have that happen? Of those five categories, I don't need to do the type because I'm already choosing a circus. It's just a circus. I don't need six different types of circuses. And for the contacts, I'm going to flush out the circus and I'll have plenty of NPCs and I'll pick one of those to be the contact like I would as a normal DM. And and the quests that they go on are just going to be the story of what's happening. So I need to be able to come up with the circus hierarchy of what ranks that each part of the circus is, which I would do a simple Google search of circus ranks and jester and ringleader, all that kind of stuff. But the meat of this thing that I really need to be able to do are the perks. So I have created yet another next level table for you guys. This is what happens whenever I don't have my PDF crew 
uh, polish these things off. This is what you get right here. Okay. Um, <laughs> these are the different categories that I took through the whole thing and broke them up into different parts. I went through all eight of the different examples they gave and I added in my own for different things that you could think of as categories as to what it could be. We'll go through these and I'll pick the circus ones. For money, compensation based on a task accomplished. Like they don't get any money unless they do the thing. And if they do a quest or a task or a mission or some kind, that's when they get paid. They could have a salary where they actually get paid like day even uh, expenses list they get some sort of preset things that you are allowed to go buy and they have uh, some sort of company card it wouldn't literally be a company card unless you have some sort of magic currency that's a whole nother video uh, shared funds compensation where if they and this was this was part of the criminal syndicate one from from the Tasha's called of everything examples is you go out on the mission and you steal stuff and you get a bunch of stuff and you have some sort of loot and the the group gets a percentage of that and the party gets a percentage of that and they they share in that together a uh, discounted item if they have some sort of army or some sort of place that they can go to and buy stuff from at a discounted price. Housing, they're able to have some, uh, housing is expensive. They, they cost stuff, food, room and board. You can have either some sort of sanctuary or safe house or literally like a place to just stay and eat. Resources, this one seems the most obvious because like what would your what would your place be able to give your party? Documentation, whether it's legit or not, or it's forged if you're part of a little criminal thing. Uh, some sort of proof of paperwork of some kind that helps you be able to uh, get into certain places. Immunity, where you're able to literally commit crimes and do other things, but it's just okay because you're a part of the group. Special services, which are, I, I've done this in my little secret group about teleportation system. Uh, the Seventh Templar had a secret, secret organization of the teleportation circles that were spread around throughout the, the town, and this was a very nice way for me to be able to let my party with some structure and limitations be able to teleport around to different places if they're part of the group contraband the sketchy stuff this comes from the criminal syndicate thing and sell stuff for you they're able to go and sell things that are maybe hard for you to find like you have this thing how am i supposed to sell this thing they have contacts to be able to go do that and contraband is they could do illegal stuff for you information is huge that's kind of what my organization in my homebrew campaign had is either the group knows stuff that the party needs to know and they need to be able to prove themselves to learn it xanthar's guide to everything great book love it uh, there's a thing for downtime and look through the downtime thing there's a whole list of all the different downtime stuff that you can pair and sync up with and put into the part of the group patrons is what they offer uh, knowledge and that's kind of like what I said earlier what are they able to know because they're a part of this group and then you have gear this is going to be the players favorite thing of like some tangible things that you actually have Res resources oh. That's, that's already right there. Uh, consumables, what different types of things do they have, whether it's scrolls or potions or cool things that are of only a temporary use so that you can kind of be control how powerful those things are. Actual equipment like gear, armor, weapons, stuff like that. Unique equipment that's actually only able to be gotten. The equipment is just things that they could get, but they just get for free, which is also kind of a resource. But unique equipment is what do they give you that only people like this can have? And maybe it identifies you and maybe the, this type of thing ties into the documentation of prove that you're part of the order some sort of symbol or some sort of armor or weapon you can use that lets you be able to have that strange gifts what weird creepy things does this group have that maybe you're not not comfortable with and like wait th this is part of it and like you get to the inner circle of this group and actually wait what is this thing for mechanics i titled it this way because this is actual tangible stat values in the game mechanical advantage type things kind of like we talked about about the advantage that you can just grant to your party this was one of the most inspirational parts because if you're a part of this what benefits do they gain literally mechanic wise so training is also another thing from xanthars where they actually have a training system where you can level up or work on different abilities maybe they're allowed to get certain features maybe it's a they there's certain subsections within the group that they're able to train and learn new custom abilities they can use in combat that'd be super cool strange boons or certain buffs of some kind or as, as long as you're a member of the order you're able to get or you have a buff to you know what i'm saying and these last two are the coolest and they came from which one did they come from religious order they came from the religious order in the religious order they have divine services and proficiencies each member of your party gains proficiency in religion i thought that was super cool and here's what it is divine sense was they let you be able to cast a free fifth level spell from a list that that, that caster can have that's an awesome service to be able to sell, save your spell caster's spell slots maybe they have a group uh, a group heroes feast where they can go take a hero's feast before they set out if they're in the main city or whatever they've proven themselves or maybe they have some sort of uh, coupon thing 
thing where they can choose to use this thing as a reward. And the proficiency one really got me thinking maybe if they join a group and at certain thresholds within the group, you give them bonus proficiencies. And this syncs up with my bonus level up system. Whenever players level up, I give them extra cool bonus perks that customize to them of how they're wanting to play their character. Let's say they join a criminal syndicate. What cool features would they be able to unlock just because they're a part of it and they'd be able to have this new feature. The first thing that popped in my head is a paladin joining a criminal syndicate to be sneaky and stuff. Maybe one of their divine smites gains the silence property and as soon as they cast divine smite, it, it makes no sound. Or if you don't want to explain it through the source of some feature that their abilities are able to do, this that could be accomplished by some sort of unique piece of equipment that the paladin has that he clutches the symbol and he becomes silent and all his footsteps that you can't hear. Him. Or if you join the group and you want to get a bonus proficiency instead of a blanket religion, you can just have a, like three or four different proficiencies that they can go choose from and they get matched up with a contact of some kind and they go get trained and then after you know whatever montage you want to do for that, they become proficient in that skill. I almost forgot, but what about my circus patron perks? I'm gonna go through this and show you guys what I'd give them. I'm adding in one, performance. Consumables, I for sure wanna do strange gifts. And of course they'll have a bonus proficiency of, you guessed it, performance. Now think out loud on this, because I literally just chose these. I would do performance, obviously, because they're circus performers. They're, they're performing all the time. They would gain bonus proficiency, but I wouldn't just give them bonus proficiency and if they already had it, of course, you know, expertise or whatever. But I would have them creatively choose what type of skill would you be performing as an act to impress people with. I love moments like this because it really lets them play their character in a different way than they normally would and think of what abilities their character would have that if they put on a show would be cool. We'd go through an RP montage or something of them practicing and training this thing and at the end of it, they'd have bonus proficiency. And maybe after they used it long enough, I'd give them a cool flavor of that cool ability in combat. For consumables, I'm picturing something like weird potions that they get of concoctions that grow and increase their size in some way. Weird potions and concoctions that I kind of want the players to be a little nervous about before they drank them. And for strange gifts, this is the one that I would have to spend a lot more time on, on what weird things do they have. Or funny things like a whoopee cushion. If they wanted to make more money they could do a performance whether they're traveling around with the actual circus themselves to make a lot of money in a big grand show or if they wanted to as a party themselves put on a circus performance show for the town that they're currently in that's so cool the only other thing i'd want to do is resources i've have something going on but this is where i'd have to see where this circus fits into the actual campaign what is the story that's going on and how does this circus play a part of that do they know some information that maybe the players would want to know is the circus have an ulterior motive where they're traveling around town for specific things and after the circus comes to town or leaves town weird stuff happens and of course for housing if you travel with the circus they'd give you room and board in one of their little tents there's an example so now the last part of this whole group patron thing is being your own patron. But all the book gives us is this little paragraph right here, which admittedly is not a lot. And this channel's evil counterpart, Icarus Games, hated the book and said that this part was awful and atrocious and it offended him. He said it's the worst D&D book, so I actually watched this video and I filmed a reaction video for it, but I don't know if I want to post it. Let me know in the comments if that's something you guys would want to see of me doing the reaction because I watched the whole thing and he makes some valid points. And the biggest point he made is this group patron system of being your own patron, not even really being a system. And I get it. I look at it. There's not much there. And I would say it's also different to create creating a, a group patron for your group to be a part of is a very different process than it, them being their own group patron. It's a completely different system. Um, and they, they reference their own Xanthar's Guide to Everything of Running a Business. But if you click on that, this is literally what it says for running a business. And that, that's it right so i totally understand that it's a little unflushed out but this video is already long enough and i wanted to talk about group patrons i could do an entire video about being your own patron so what do you guys want to see do you want to see a reaction to that video that i did or would you rather see a video about being your own patron or both and the how to be your own patron video would also cover how to run your own business because it's pretty much the same thing as far as monetarily wise and then you would just have an extra thing added on about the group patron part of all the different minions you'd be able to control this whole tasha's cauldron of everything video series has been really fun i got another video coming out next week over the spells and stuff and then we get into magical tattoos all the others we're going to get through absolutely everything and hope we're going to fly by it i'm trying to have faster paced videos i don't know how long this video is going to be back to the chair so there's my thoughts on group patrons and how i would use them and how i hope i've inspired to help you use them in your game Chapter one on this Tasha's Cauldron of Everything series is over custom origins and custom lineage and my homebrew take and run with it stance on that. If you want to be a group patron of mine, link for my Patreons right here. Hopefully you guys can tell that I'm stepping on my content with more videos. I got a quick short series of a homebrew huddle series that I've been doing and this Tasha's Cauldron stuff. Giving you lots of tools to stay creative and think outside that box. Peace.